Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining our uh, Tech Talk today. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to get started. So you're probably curious why I have a pile of Legos on my screen right now. And <clears throat> these Legos are a lot like your enterprise applications. They're valuable by themselves. Each piece uh, or each application is very valuable, has a function, does a job. It's probably done it for years and years, maybe decades even. Um, and that's great. But what you'll find is if you actually take and uh, take those individual pieces and put them together or knit them together, hence the name of our talk today, um, you can end up with something that's more valuable than the sum of the parts. In the case of Legos, you know, you, I can make a car, uh, I can get more extreme and make something like this, uh, but in, in uh, the area of your enterprise applications, by taking those different applications and knitting them together, you can end up with something that's much more valuable and brings a lot more value to your uh, company uh, by uh, integrating those together. And that's what we'll talk about today. But first, let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Tony Karate. I'm a senior systems engineer with Attachmate. I'm the uh, product leadership team lead for the integration products, which is what we're going to talk about today. Those include the Veristream product line. So <clears throat> let's get started. Um, a while back, there was a uh, survey that was done, and uh, the question on the survey was, you know, are services important? And um, what was interesting in the results were 81% of the respondents said that a services approach was, was important, and 76 of those uh, said that those services that they felt were important would involve existing enterprise applications. And 54% said that those services need uh, to be some of the services need to be based on legacy applications, so mainframes, AS400s, VAX, Unix, things like that. Um, so, again, these applications that have been running for years and decades in your organization uh, and across many customers' organizations are very important to their business. They're they're you know a core of their business, and they have to stay up. And in order to extend that reach out to services and a services type approach, those have to play into that whole environment and architecture as well. But an interesting thing on this was 84% of the people that responded said that it was hard to sell this type of approach to the business. And why? Because the projects were too big, they're too complex and, uh, and costly, and they're risky. There's, you, the time frames can stretch really long. Uh, there can be a lot of mission creep on, and things like that on it. Uh, and so we're going to talk about some of that. So when we talk about a services approach, you know, how... Are there, there are different ways to do this. So um, there are many paths, but which one is right for you? It really depends on you know, what you want to get done. So we'll talk about the different approaches and some of the pros and cons to each. So first of all um, is a scenario that we call rip and replace, which is very similar to what you would see uh, in building construction, where they'll do a demolition and demolish an entire building to build a new one up. So basically, they're tearing out the old building and uh, building a new one. And you can do the same thing with your enterprise applications uh, if you wanted to move them, say, from a mainframe to a Unix environment or a Linux environment or even a Windows environment where you can rewrite the entire application, all that business logic, you know, all the business rules that have been there for years into that new uh, environment. It's not easy, um, obviously, because you're rewriting an entire application that, you know, could have been built over, you know, several years or even decades, um, so it's not necessarily the easiest uh, way to do it. Uh, the second way is what we call rehosting, and basically what that is is moving your application from one platform to another. Um, so uh, there are tools, uh, you know, out there that can help you do this to a point. Uh, Microfocus has some tools. Uh, uh, such as uh, Visual Cobol, uh, things like that, and their Microfocus Cobol products that will run COBOL applications in uh, environments other than a mainframe or an AS400 or VAX, Unix type of environment. Uh, specifically, mainframe, though, is, is you know, uh, COBOL intensive. So if you wanted to move those over, there are tools that will allow you to run those applications on other platforms. But they don't, they're not necessarily seamless. It isn't just I install it in a new environment and drop in a, a tool and then it runs. A lot of times, uh, you know, file systems are completely different. Storage systems are different. The way you access databases and the types of databases are different. So a lot of times there's still changes that need to be made in order to do a rehosting type of solution. So the third way is to leave it in place and leverage it where it 
where it is. And that's really what we're mainly going to talk about today. Um, that's what Veristream uh, is really meant to do. Uh, it allows you to leave those applications on your mainframe or your AS400 Vax, Unix, Linux environment and then uh, present that data out or abstract that data out in a different form that can be used by other systems and other devices like smartphones or tablets, uh, even other applications, browser-based uh, applications, things like that. Uh, so that's what we're going to talk about today. So, you know, the first question is why would someone do services? So a services-oriented architecture, um, a lot of our customers, as you saw from the uh, from that survey, find this a very important approach. And, and why is that? What are the advantages to uh, doing a services-oriented approach? Well, uh, these are some uh, magazines and some articles from magazines that I found. And to kind of point this out, so what are some of the advantages? Software reuse is one, where <clears throat> you can build a service today that has a specific purpose, say to log in or change an change a address for a customer, look up customer information. And then you can take those individual discrete services and, and orchestrate those into a unit of work. So one service that does a function like changing an address, which may use a discrete service to log in, another one to look up a customer, a third to bring in the customer's information, and finally one that actually changes the uh, uh, customer's address. Um, now, to your development staff, once you've orchestrated that, that looks like one service that just does change address or update account, whatever the, count, the uh, case might be. But it's really, you know, four discrete services. And the advantage of that is, as this shows, is software re reuse, where I can build those discrete uh, units of work today, you know, those services today, and orchestrate those together into a unit of work. But then I can use those same services to do other units of work um, and build other services on top of that. I can also extend this out um, to other platforms, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So the second is productivity increases. By being able to reuse those services, you know, developers can very quickly move uh, within a team and work on new projects because a lot of the work's already done. If you have these discrete services in place to do a new unit of work, you know, maybe three quarters or even, you know, 80% of the work is already done in these dis discrete services, and you just need to orchestrate those in order for the developers to use those. So it makes it much faster and by being faster, much cheaper to do. And third is increased agility. And this really comes from being able to build a, uh, a set of services or a set of units of work that are used in one part of your business, say customer service, to change an address or update an account or even transfer funds depending on the type of, of industry that you're in. Uh, but be able to reuse those same services uh, to do other initiatives like uh, customer self-service or allow a portal for your uh, suppliers or um, uh, partners in uh, or even an IVR system, things like that. So it allows the agility to move to new initiatives very quickly, number one. Number two, at a much lower cost because a lot of the work has already been done when you build the initial application for whatever point solution you're looking at. And, you know, we see these <coughs> in different app, uh, different uh, magazines, kind of the same theme over and over, agility, cost, control, things like that. These are why services are important. So let's go back to that uh, survey results for a moment. And the thing I want to focus on is that last one there, you know, that these projects are hard to sell to the business because they're big and complex and costly and they can be very risky with, you know, slipping time frames, things like that. And that causes businesses a lot of anxiety, you know, hence the picture here. And really when we talk about these things and, and these negatives about services, uh, you know, we're really talking about rip and replace and rehosting because as I already pointed out, uh, you know, rip and replace to rebuild an entire application on a new platform is very risky and, very, and can be very costly and take a long time uh, and be a very large project. And even rehosting, when you're moving it from one platform to another, you can run into the, some of those issues, uh, as I mentioned, like uh, file system types, uh, database types, where you have to rewrite pieces of the application, not the entire application like rip and replace, but pieces of it in order to integrate them into a new environment. Now, what's nice about repurposing an application uh, where you're actually leaving the application where it is, you don't have to change that application. All you're doing is abstracting the data out from that application and presenting it out in a different manner. 
And like I said earlier, that's really what Veristream focuses on. So let's talk a little bit about Veristream. Um, you know, there's four things we like to talk about when we talk about Veristream. Number one, that it's a safe investment. Um, you know, we only use market-leading open standards within Veristream. It's not a proprietary solution where you have, uh, you know, a proprietary messaging system that you have to implement in order to use it or other tools like business process language uh, tools, uh, orchestration tools, things like that that are um, specific to uh, Veristream. You can use any uh, open standard uh, system you want to to integrate these services that are created with uh, Veristream into. Number two, uh, it's secure. Um, you know, access is controlled to the data from those enterprise systems. So first of all, no uh, access control is bypassed by Veristream. So whatever type of access control you use today, whether it be RACF or ACF2 or Top Secret or any application level security, we don't bypass. It's still leveraged. So, you know, there's a big advantages to that. You're not bypassing any security, number one. Number two, if you have things like audit and roll-ups, things like that. I know I work with financial uh, institutions and they'll have uh, cash boxes for each of their tellers at a, at a uh, branch. Those uh, functions and those roll-ups and auditing type of, of uh, routines are still in place because we don't uh, change the application at all. As well as the fact that using Veristream you can use these market leading standards for security like uh, SSL, TLS, SSH, uh, things like that in order to secure the data as it's moving across the network. Um, so you don't have to worry about uh, data being intercepted in between the Veristream server and the client uh, if you've set up the uh, you know security as uh, as defined uh, within your enterprise. Now, it's not required, but it is there if you want to use it. And most of our customers do want to use that type of thing. Third is that Veristream is very quick. It's a low-risk solution by being quick that requires no legacy host application changes. So like I said, it requires no application changes. It uses those applications as they are in place and basically allows you to abstract the data out that you require for your solution. Even though there's a whole bunch of data on a screen, it doesn't mean that Veristream has to allow all that data to be uh, visible to a client. You decide what pieces are important and what you want to expose, depending on, on what type of solution you build with Veristream. And fourth is, you know, it's strategic. The, you know, an arch a strategic architectural approach that leverages service orchestration um, and services-oriented architecture allows you to uh, be very nimble and very agile with the solution that you build and allows you to extend that solution later to other platforms or other uh, business units, things like that. So those are the four main things we talk about when we talk about Veristream and how it affects your business. So <laughs> this is a high level diagram of, of Veristream. You can kind of see uh, the different access levels. You can get directly into CICS applications either be, uh, via BMS maps or via transactions. We're not going to get into that today, um, but uh, that is available within the Veristream product family. You can also get directly into different applications through the data stream itself, 3270, 5250, VT Unix. You see all the different host types there. It allows you to create these services, these discrete services here, and then there's another piece within Veristream called Veristream Process Designer that allows you to orchestrate those. But again, because of the services that are created out of these pieces here, Veristream pieces here are uh, standards-based, you can use any orchestration piece that you'd like. But we do have one if you don't have one on site. And ours is open and uh, does not just integrate in Veristream services, but also custom web services. So if you've built web services within your organization that you want to, uh, you know, orchestrate into a solution, you know, into a set of business logic and business rules for uh, some type of unit of work, you can do that. Or you could use third-party um, web services such as Amazon Web Services, uh, you know, uh, Google Web Services, Bing Web Services, it uh, doesn't really matter um, what they are as long as they're standards based then you can incorporate those into your solution as well using Veristream. So what are the different ways that you can use Veristream Host Integrator? And that's the main product I'm going to uh, focus on today. That was the top one we showed there a second ago in this, in this uh, 
diagram. So what are the different ways you can use it? Well, there's really three main ways. One is rejuvenation, which is basically HTML on the fly. And I'm going to go into each of these individually in a little bit of depth and show you some demos of each. Uh, second is to repurpose the, the application. So you're presenting it in a completely different manner than what uh, your end users today are used to. Uh, and again, we'll go deeper into this. And the third is kind of a hybrid where you can mix the two together, which is an approach that's fairly unique to this product. and. Uh, uh, fairly unique to some customers recently that have expressed uh, a lot of interest in that. So I'll show you some, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit and I'll show you some demonstrations of that as well. So the first way, like I said, is called rejuvenation or a rejuvenated HTML5 web application. It looks a lot like the green screen that your users are used to today, um, except it's uh, HTML5 throughout. So it doesn't require a terminal emulator in order to uh, uh, display the data. As you can see, you know, my screenshot here, I'm showing it running in a, uh, uh, on an iPad. Uh, so any device that can display HTML5 can display this application and display this green screen. And again, because it's just a representation of what's on your host, you know, zero changes are made. And so what we're going to do now is a quick demo, and I'll show you. We actually call this the five-minute application, uh, and you'll see that I can build this in, in about five minutes or less. So let me go to that VM. So this is the uh, VHI Developer Studio. So what I'm going to do here is just say I want to do a new project or new model, and I'm going to call this, uh, I'm just going to call it test. So we have one called test. I'm going to tell it where I want to connect to, the host I want to connect to, dallas.attachme.com, oops, dot com, and the port I need is 623, so I'm going to connect to this guy. You can see I can tell it to do Telnet, Telnet Extended, uh, use TLS SL, uh, SSL, a secure proxy, whatever the case might be. So uh, in this, for this demo, I'm just going to connect directly to it uh, via Telnet. So once I tell it to connect, you can see that it connects to my mainframe. And so at this point, I'm connected to my mainframe, and I don't, in order to do that rejuvenated application, I don't have to do anything else. All I have to do is save this model and then deploy this model to my local server, so my development server that comes with the development kit. I'm going to put in my credentials. Uh, oops. I know I put in the wrong password. And we're going to say OK. And it's going to deploy to our local server here. OK, it's deployed to our local server. And then the last thing I need to do is just run another component of the design studio called Web Builder, Veristream Web Builder. <clears throat> so Web Builder is going to come up here. And automatically it says, do you want to create a new project? And the default is an HTML5 web app, which is what we want to do. Uh, and I can change a bunch of stuff. Some of the other options here, uh, if we had done a little bit more, and you'll see more of this with the rejuvenation, things like that, or with the uh, repurposing and uh, the hybrid type of application. But you can create an object, either a, a class library or a bean. Uh, we also have specific Java web applications and .NET web, web applications that are more for legacy applications uh, and legacy solutions. Most customers today will will generate, if they're going to do rejuvenation, they'll generate a HTML5 web application. So I'm just going to go into the properties for a moment. And the one thing I need to do here is just tell it, uh, you know, when I hit a recognize screen, I want to go to a form, but I haven't told it how to recognize any screen. So on the unrecognized screens, I want to make sure that it's set for terminal. So on both of these, I want to make sure they're set for terminal and then say OK and then build, and it's going to build my web application here. Just take a moment. OK, it's compiling and deploying. Now it's bringing up my application. And boom, I'm connected to my host. You saw how long it took. I mean, probably less than five minutes. Uh, you can see that I'll show you how this thing works. So I can just say I want to go to CICS VBIA, which is one of my regions in here. And then I'm going to log in. And uh, you'll notice some of these things here. If I uh, mouse over it, it, it says uh, it recognizes the word enter. And this is called a, a hot spot. And so uh, you see the, the cursor turns into a finger. And 
the tooltip says transmit and enter to the host when I click that, or this F3, it recognizes that. You, there, you can actually add in different ones you want to make sure it, it uh, recognizes that. So we're going to click that. It's going to do an enter. I could have just hit the enter key. Now here I want to do a clear screen before I actually do anything else. And, you know, if I was looking at an iPad, working on an iPad or something like that, um, you know, Kindle, something like that, I don't have a... Uh, you know, clear key on my keyboard. So up here under function, if I click on that, you can see that it shows me all the function keys that are available for this host type. So it's specific to the type of host that I'm connecting to. In this case, it's a mainframe, so it's mainframe centric. If it's an AS400, the keys would be different. Uh, and again, for VT, the same thing. So I can have the same control keys and, and uh, function keys uh, that I have uh, in a terminal emulator within a browser as well. So I'm going to do a clear here so it does a clear for me and then I'm going to go into an application TCHP I'm going to tell it I want to go to 1 and then put in an account number 5624 hit enter and it brings up the account that I was looking for. So you can see how this works just the same as a terminal would. Um, Again, I can click on this PFO3. It recognizes that as a PF3, so I click that. It goes back one, goes back again. Now I'm, I've logged out of my uh, transaction. I can go ahead and do another clear key, and then just do CSF log off to gracefully log off my mainframe, and then I'm back to my uh, demo or my uh, uh, splash screen on my host. I can disconnect this session just so I don't hang it up, and I'm done with that. Uh, uh, you can see how long it took. Very easy to do, very simple to do. Again, that's why we call that the uh, uh, the five minute application. So let's continue on in our presentation. So the second manner that you can do use Veristream Host Integrator is what we call a repurposed mobile application. And this could be a mobile application, uh, could be a browser based application. Doesn't really matter. But basically, I'm presenting the data as you can see in a completely different way from what. A green, the data on a green screen would look like. And for, in this application, we actually did this for uh, LA County Superior Court, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But um, let me run through that kind of that business case and, and why they decided they needed to use Veristream in order to do this. Uh, and then I'll show you a demo of this as well. So a few numbers. Um, uh, the LA County Superior Court is the largest judicial system in the country. You know, three million people pass through the courts every year, and they were facing $650 million in statewide budget cuts, which was going to result in 50 courtrooms in LA closing and 300 court workers being laid off. So, <laughs> you would, as you can imagine, that's going to cause some problems for LA County Superior Courts. And their biggest problem was this. They would have public offices that can't keep up. They'd have these huge lines, and they'd have multiple lines, uh, each one for different things. And you know, the people walking in there, it, let's say you got a parking ticket or a speeding ticket in LA County. In order to pay that, you would go to the courthouse, and then you'd have to figure out which line you were supposed to be in, and then wait in line. Um, if you didn't know your citation number or how much you had to pay, or if you wanted to schedule a court appearance or reschedule a court appearance, things like that. So they had these huge lines. And that really became a security con concern. People would get very frustrated. And one of the things that would happen is when these courthouses closed at 2.30 in the afternoon, it didn't matter if you were in line for five minutes or you were in line for five hours. Um, they're closed. You have to come back the next day. So what they would end up doing is about a half an hour before they close, and I'm going to highlight this in red, they would have sheriff's deputies come over uh, to kind of keep the peace when the doors closed because uh, people would get very frustrated and very upset about this. So, you know, how did, uh, you know, the the employees within the court system try to solve this. Well, they would walk through the line with a piece of paper, and they'd write down people's names, and they would write down, uh, you know, what they needed, and then uh, maybe two or three or four people, they'd write it on a piece of paper, go back to the back office, try and look these people up, find out the information, write it down, then find them in line and tell them, look, you can go to this place and write a check and drop it in that drop box and be on your way, and you don't, excuse me, you don't have to wait in line. Um, what they'd rather do is have a mobile application where they could walk through the line and as they talk to a person they could look up their information uh, while they're standing there, give it to them, tell them exactly what they needed to do and then the people could get out of line and be much happier. So what they really wanted was a mobile application to verify the citation status to route people to the correct places uh, and that made the lines much more efficient and the people are much happier well, with the solution. So some of the requirements they had when they talked to us was 
that the application had to be zero footprint. So it couldn't be built for a specific operating system. It couldn't be an uh, iOS application or an Android application because each court can do kind of their own thing when it comes to devices. So they didn't know if a courthouse would have uh, iPads or uh, they would have Android devices or Kindles or Fires or whatever the case might be or netbooks. So they wanted something that was device agnostic. So it would work regardless of the app of the platform that it was going to be displayed on. And it had to be built from existing applications without modifying them. So uh, they talked to us about that, and this is kind of the solution that we came up with. So I'm going to show you a, a short demo of that. Switch back to my VM here. So if we go back over to here, and this is the application that we came up with. Uh, as you can see, it says ACF2 ID, ACF2 password. So you know we talked about security a moment ago, uh, but I'll reiterate this. You'll notice I, I'm having to log in with my ACF2 credentials. Also, what these court workers do when they connect these uh, devices, these tablets up, is they actually connect VPN into a private wireless network within the courthouse. So it's not open to the public. This is not a publicly accessible uh, application today. It's just for the court workers because the data that's on the back end system is, is uh, uh, is privileged and so they can't allow uh, access to all the users. So that's how they do it. They encrypt the data as it goes across the air uh, through the wireless network as well as uh, requiring a VPN connection back in and ACF2 credentials in order to access it. So we'll go ahead and log in. And once it's logged in, then it presents me with several different ways to search. I can search by name, by, uh, by uh, driver's license number, or by citation number, but <coughs> let's walk through it all. So. Let's say I, I'm a court worker and I find a person in line and uh, you know they need to pay for a traffic citation. So I put in their first and last name. Um, I have a bunch of other options here. I can put in their middle name if they have a suffix, you know, junior, senior, the third, whatever the case might be. I can go by date of birth. Uh, I can also tell how many records to bring back. Uh, by default, it's 21, which is three pages worth on their host screen. Um, but we can tell it to bring back all of them. And I'll kind of show you that in a minute. So let's search for John Doe. And so it's going to go out and look. And it comes back with 21 different uh, different results because we told it 21. Now, if I change this to be 42 and search again, you'll notice that it comes back with 42 results here in a second. So it says 42 here, and I can scroll down. And again, this is if you do this on a touch screen, you can scroll right through it. It's kind of nice. And I'm going to go ahead and pick one here, John, this John Doe, and it brings up his citation information based on his uh, on his operator license number. And this is a, some test data. So this person has 46, which is crazy. But these are all test uh, uh test citation, so I just click on that one there, and it brings up by citation number and by court number, um, because different citation numbers uh, are associated with specific uh, courts, so uh, you have to have all that information in order to get the right citation number up, and it tells me that, uh, you know, this person needs to pay, wow, $2,296 for this violation in order to get out of it, so... Um, so that's uh, that's what they would owe. They could write a check for that, drop it in the Dropbox, and be on their way, and not have to worry about it. So that this allows the the uh, court workers to walk through that line, and they even call the application, walk the line, uh, and and look up information for people as they're in line, put them in the right place, uh, make sure they have all the information they need to pay their citation if they want to. Um, anyway, so that's just an example of of what can be done with Fairstream and what we did do for one customer. So let's move on to the third way uh, that we're going to talk about today, and that's an embedded uh, HTML web application. This is kind of a hybrid of the two I just talked about. In this case, we did, uh, in this example, we actually did a solution for a uh, casino, uh, hotel casino, and what they wanted to do was allow their uh, end users to look up uh, guest information, not just to allow them to create a new a new reservation, things like that, but also look at the different uh, room rates that were available based on occupancy. Also allow them to go ahead and, and uh, get 
you know, tickets for shows and, and restaurant reservations and all this all in one single interface. So they could see exactly what, you know, the information about this guest, their average rate, their average number of days that they would stay, um, you know, things like that. So they can have a holistic approach and a holistic view of all the customer's information. But one of the things that was important to this customer was the fact that a lot of their customer service reps are very good with the AS400 system that this is based on. So they didn't necessarily want them to have to use the HTML interface if they didn't want to. So there's this little button up here that if they click it, it gives them a terminal view. And they can actually put data in here if they want, but the other data uh, that comes from other sources is still available on the side. So they, they really liked that feature uh, of Verisim, the ability to go ahead and switch back and forth. Uh, and this is what it looks like on an iPad. Uh, they, uh, they wanted to be able to to run this, one of the reasons they wanted a pure HTML5 solution was they wanted the ability to run it not only on a desktop in a browser, but also on a device like an iPad. And the reason was they wanted to be able to allow their uh, their gaming tables, so let's say a pit boss uh, at a blackjack table, if a person comes up with their uh, player's card and presents it, typically that Pit boss will take it, put the information into the AS400, uh, you know, what their average bet is, things like that, so they can get points, things like that. They can offer them comps, free rooms, free dinners, free shows, whatever the case might be. But they wanted, they also wanted that, um, that pit boss or that dealer to be able to, to know a little more information about this guest to make their stay and their interaction much more personal. So, you know, things like, okay, what shows are they scheduled to see or have they seen? You know, what type of room are they in now? And maybe I can offer them a comp if they're betting a lot, things like that. So when they bring the card back, they can say, oh, by the way, how was dinner at Lotus of Siam last night? You know, I really love that place. Or, you know, did you like, or you're really going to enjoy Mystere. I love it. It's a great show, blah, 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 whatever the case might be. So again, it allows them to make their, the guests stay much more personal, which hopefully in the view of the casino and the hotel, uh, will bring that customer back there because they feel more like their uh, people are, uh, are, are interested in, in how they uh, like their stay, how things are going, uh, things like that. It makes them more apt to, to return to the same property. So let me show you a demo of this as well. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and go over here and load up our demo. Okay, if you give me one second, it looks like my, uh, for some reason, my PowerPoint died, so I'll have to bring that back up in a minute. But, uh, so this is the, the, uh, the demo that we have that we kind of built before we did the uh, proof of concept on site. So if I hit this toggle button, you'll see that there's an AS400 session behind the scenes that's actually running. Uh, and that's what's driving this data over here. Now these pieces over here are driven by other uh, services through Veristream and, and uh, through other pieces. Uh, this top one comes from a database and you'll see that fill in in here in a moment. So if I go Smith, Joe Smith, we're gonna look up Joe Smith. I'm going to search on Joe Smith. It's going to go out against the S400, find all the Joe Smiths, and I select the correct one. In this case, it's the top one. And what it's going to do is grab that customer data and the customer guest number and then look up historical information about that guest from a database. So this is running out of a database. Uh, we've just done a web service call. Again, you can orchestrate this all with Veristream products uh, if you want to, um, but it's not a requirement. Uh, so I have this information here. Uh, one of the things I could do is say, hey, I want a new reservation. So this guest is called in to customer service and they want a new reservation. Uh, I have all the guest information here. When I say I want a new reservation, what it's going to do is go out and look up that guest number, bring back that information. It's going to automatically fill in some data based on uh, what I've clicked, uh, but it also goes out and gets room rates. This comes from the AS400 as well, but what the end user used to have to do is have two sessions up. So one session up that looked like this to show them all the customer information and another session that they'd have to tab over to to look up the uh, different guest room rate information. And they would have to put in, retype in things like the arrival date and the departure date and the number of adults and children, where in this case, I can actually take that data from this screen and then call against that web service again that's using Veristream uh, to bring that information up. Uh, to show you that, you know, how interactive this is, if I type test into this attention field here and toggle back to the terminal view, you see it puts in test and vice versa. If I 
put something in the terminal and then toggle back, you'll notice that it comes back. And it doesn't really matter what type of field it is. I can make this HTML screen look different from what the host screen does. If I click on this NRG field here, let's put a checkbox there. If we go back here, you'll notice that it puts in a Y. And the reverse is true, too. If I go to the TRN uh, field, put in a Y, and toggle back, you'll notice now it's checked. So I can make things a lot easier for the end user to use, uh, even though the data that's going back to the back end system is the same as if they were using that um, that uh, directly. You know, some of the other things I can do with this, again, we wanted they wanted a holistic uh, view of all the data. I can look at events, and what this does is calls a different web service out to a events uh, website that we built a, a web service against, grabs the arrival and departure information, and then shows the different uh, available sh uh, shows and, and things like that that are available during their this guest stay. And then I can try to let them know that that's there. Maybe they want to, uh, you know, uh, schedule some tickets, buy some tickets for one of those shows during their stay. Now, I can also go into this restaurants tab and actually go in here and say, uh, this this guest also wants to have dinner on the 22nd, uh, say at 8 o'clock p.m. Um, for two. And, uh, you know, I can look at all the restaurants or a specific restaurant. We're going to say all and do a search. And this calls a web service through uh, that we built against uh, opentable.com, which uh, looks at all the restaurants that are available in this different uh, 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 hotel and resort, and then I can choose one like this one here. I have an eight o'clock reservation, so I'm going to click eight o'clock. You'll notice that it's made it made a reservation at uh, Cananita. I, I hope I said that right, uh, and it's been made for Joe Smith party of two at this time. We well, notice I never put in Joe Smith. That's a great thing about this is the end user doesn't have to retype data over and over again, um, and by doing that, then I have less chance of you know, a much better data integrity. So the data that's going amongst the different systems is exactly the same because I'm, I'm taking it from one source. Instead of requiring the end user to type the same data in multiple times into the different interfaces, I can just use one, and it can show me all that information. And uh, just to show you, you know, this back end uh, works great here. I can go ahead and click in here. And again, it's just like that rejuvenation that I showed you. If I hit PF3, it's going to back out one. I'm going to do it again. I can use this hotspot here or the PF3 key, and then I'm going to tell it to log off real quick. So do 90, which is sign out, and boom, I'm back to the sign on screen. So it just gives you an idea of what can be done. So let's uh, quickly bring that PowerPoint back up and display it. And I just got to go to the correct slide here. Sorry. I don't know why it blew up on us, but it did. So let's get to the correct spot. I apologize for that. I'm getting close to the end here. Okay, went through that and that and that. Did our presentation on that, our demo on that. Okay, so, uh, you know, I talked about this, uh, the different four different things we talk about when we talk about Veristream. And one of the things I talked about was quick, you know, this low risk solution that requires no host legacy changes. I want to tell you a quick story about a customer. So I have an insurance com customer and they sell all their insurance policies through uh, independent insurance agents. So what happens is, you know, a customer calls an independent insurance agent and says, I want a quote for home insurance or uh, life insurance or auto insurance, whatever the case might be. And then what their independent insurance agents had to do was go through these green screens to generate a quote. And so, uh, you know, it was a little bit cumbersome. And again, these are independent insurance agents, so they, they represent a lot of different companies, not just the company that I was working with. And some of those companies have web interfaces instead of this, you know, traditional green screen type interface that uh, this company had. And so what they found when they kind of... Uh, uh, surveyed their independent insurance agents was for every 20 uh, um, calls from customers asking for a quote that they were only getting four quotes out the door through those independent insurance agents for their insurance co uh, insurance uh, coverage. So, you know, they asked the insurance agents why, you know, are we only getting four out on average out of 20? Um, 
you know, why aren't you quoting ours more? And they said, well, your system's more difficult to use than XYZ insurance company, and uh, it's hard to learn, and I don't remember, and all kinds of different things. So they decided, well, what we need to do was, uh, what we need to do is to rebuild our application so that it's much easier to use, uh, more modern interface, things like that. So they embarked on a project, and they took 18 months to try and rewrite their system. And the whole rip and replace uh, paradigm that I told you about, that's exactly what they tried to do, to take a new system, rebuild their entire application, all the uh, actuarials and everything else on this new system. And after 18 months, it completely failed because it was just too big and too expensive and too giant of a job to get done. So they kind of regrouped and said, what do we do instead? Well, we're going to try the rehosting thing instead. So they tried to move it to a different system. But again, they ran into the same type of problems and they spent another 18 months uh, and that project failed as well. So it's very interesting. This company had gone through, you know, 36 months of trying to, you know, revamp their interface for their independent insurance agents, basically their partners, um, and they then and spent a lot of money trying to do it and couldn't get it done. So we came in and talked to them about, about Veristream and they were very skeptical uh, because they had already failed twice trying to do this on their own. So we went in and did a two-day proof concept just to prove to them, because they didn't believe that we could do this, uh, prove to them that it could be done. And we did and they were impressed. And so they said, okay, since we have failed twice, we want you to do the whole project. So they asked us, our services people, to come in and do the entire thing. So start to finish in six weeks. Uh, we went in and started the project, built the entire thing out, tested it, uh, deployed it into production uh, in six weeks, which obviously, you know, in two failed 18-month projects, uh, you know, and getting it done in, you know, uh, less than 90 days, actually, uh, six weeks, I mean, it was less than 45 days, uh, they were blown away that we could do it that quickly. But again, because you're not rebuilding everything, you're leaving everything in place, requiring no host changes, it doesn't take nearly as long to do this type of thing. So we did that, and what they found almost immediately after they introduced this to their insurance agents is the number of quotes that they're getting out the door for the same number of calls doubled. So instead of you know, getting uh, five out, they were getting 10 out of those 20 or 25 calls that were coming in. So that translated into, you know, more money and, uh, you know, a very quick return on investment because the project didn't take that long, so it didn't cost as much, number one. And number two, it immediately impacted their sales. Uh, so that was able allowed them to uh, recoup that cost uh, that they put into this very quickly, a matter of months. I think it was six to seven months. Another interesting fact is the guy that actually brought us in and did this project ended up getting promoted after this because it hit the bottom line of the company so well that it, you know, it was a huge success and you know, he got all kinds of accolades and ended up getting promoted, which was great for him. Um, so I'm going to do one more demo. And basically, you know, when we talked about, when I was talking about this earlier, we talked about the way that, you know, you can present this data in different, in a different manner on a different platform. So what I'm going to do quickly is actually show you some of those demos that I showed you before in a new one um, on uh, uh, on an iPad, if I can get to it. One moment. I think I have to minimize the sky. minimize this. Oh, it's behind by, give me a moment here, just need to close that and then bring this guy back up. I apologize for the delay here. Oh, I probably have to tell my, that's why. So let's go back to our PowerPoint for just a second here and display that and then I'll show you my screen from my iPad. Here we go. I'm just going to move this guy over here so you can see it. So there's my iPad. And get rid of that. Get that down. Okay. So if I go into Safari here on my iPad, um, these are different applications. You know, the one I showed you with the court, I can go ahead and do that real quickly. So if I put in my user information and, oops, put in my password. Log in. It's going to log me into the system. And then I can search on John Doe again. John Doe. 
search. You can see I can scroll through this. It's very easy to use uh, on an iPad. I can choose one like I did before by just clicking on it. Uh, and it's going to bring up that operator license information, and I can look at the citation number and the citation information right there. Um, I can also show you, I'll show you a different one here real quick. So if I go in here and look up a social security number, two, three, four, nine, payroll information is, and then the password is put in my login information and then search. It's going to give me a bunch of information about this employee. In this case, this is for another uh county organization. It's Mickey Mouse, blah, blah, blah. It tells me the employment history, things like that. I can actually look at, you know, the different times they were doing, um, they were employed and <laughs> what their salary was, things like that. I can also get the status thing and, uh, you know, I don't know what a five is, but if I just click on that, it tells me, oh, it's provisional. So I don't even, I can add things in here that aren't on the host system uh, to make it easier for people to do this. Now, I also talked about being able to use third-party applications. So you'll notice here I have, uh, you know, a Google Map representation of where this employee lives. Um, if I change this to be something else like, uh, uh, like uh, 1500 Dexter Avenue North, and we're going to say Seattle, Washington, clear these two out and say update, you'll notice, boom, it actually shows me the Google Map representation of that address. So what I've done is I've used host data, integrated it in with, uh, uh, with Google Maps data uh, in the same presentation. So I can make this look even though the data is coming from a mainframe or an AS400 or VAX, Unix, whatever the, the host system is, uh, by integrating it in with other uh, applications and other services, I can make it look completely different from what the end users are, are used to looking at. So that's just an example of, you know, uh, bringing, uh, you know, being able to bring this stuff out uh, in other uh, presentation forms for your end users. I'm go ahead and log out of that guy, too. So... Uh, Let's get back to our presentation. And that's pretty much the end of it. So are there any questions uh, that any of you have for me? I'd be well, love to answer them if you have any. No question. I'm not hearing any questions. OK, is there any in the chat window? Let's see here. No, I'm not seeing any. Um, Okay, well, with that, I guess there's no questions. Uh, thank you for your time, and uh, I hope you have a great day. And if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to contact us. Um, here's uh, some of our information. Uh, you can always email us, um, and, uh, and we can, uh, and we can uh, answer your questions. Thanks a lot. Have a great day.